who will give a model dependent uh, view on electroweak <laughs> constraints in uh, composite Higgs models. <coughs> okay. Now you hear me? <laughs> okay, good afternoon. My name is Matteo Salvarezza, and I will tell you about one loop electroweak constraints in composite Higgs models. So this is an outline. First I will talk about composite Higgs model and electroweak precision tests in general. Then I will focus on the minimal model. Then I will make some UV extension of this model adding resonances. And I will test such a, such a model with electroweak precision observables. So what's a composite Higgs model about? Uh, in a composite Higgs model there is some strongly interacting sector, the TV scale, which is responsible for the electric symmetry breaking, and the Higgs boson is a composite state formed by these strong dynamics. So this automatically solves the hierarchy problem, as now we have a natural cutoff, which is the compositeness scale of the Higgs boson. But of course, introduces another, because uh, <coughs> we have to face this sort of big mass gap between the Higgs, which is light, and the resonances, which are expected to appear at the TV scale. So, uh, how can we account for such a picture? We can account for such a picture by thinking the Higgs boson as a pseudo nambo Goldstone boson for emerging from some uh, spontaneously symmetry breaking. So, the ge just like as a pion from QCD. <coughs> so, the general recipe for such a construction is consider some strongly interacting sector which is uh, uh, invariant under some global G spontaneously broken down to H at the scale F bigger than the electric scale. And suppose you want to build an effective field theory for the Higgs boson as, a, and as, as an exact, exact Goldson boson of this symmetry. Then to this composite sector, we must couple the standard model sector, which we think as elementary. So this in general will break the global G, as the standard model is not invariant under G. Uh, and so this um, can, um, this explicit breaking at the level of quantum correction can generate a Higgs potential uh, at one loop which will finally account for the Higgs mass and the electric symmetry breaking. So, as I said, we have to build some effective field theory for the Higgs as a Goldstone boson, so the Higgs Lagrangian will be non-standard, so the Higgs couplings will be non-standard. So, among the, the experimental signatures of such a class of models, we will have some direct signatures, so for example, measure the Higgs couplings and discover resonances, but also indirect signatures like, like uh, I mean, the primary reference are electric precision tests. So, um, since the experimental, uh, experimental accuracy on such measurement is very high and will, uh, will increase in the future, as has been, it has been said many times in the previous talks, I, I, indirect constraints uh, can be still competitive with direct constraints. So, uh, for the particular model uh, I will introduce, um, the two relevant parameters are these ones, so the epsilon 1 and epsilon 3 parameters in the, uh, oblique, um, in the oblique new physics scenario, so universal contributions. So they are defined um, through some combination of gauge boson self-energies. So a primary effect which is common to all uh, composite X uh, models to electric precision tests is this uh, non-standard coupling, uh, Higgs couplings. So, for example, in Epsilon 3, in the standard model, the sum of these two, di these two diagrams is finite, but if you introduce a rescale in the couplings, uh, a divergent term uh, pops out. So, the same also, um, the same effect uh, we have for Epsilon 1, and this is the result on the experimentally allowed region. So, uh, the black dot is the standard model uh, prediction, and the red is where you go if you rescale. So, you see the effect is very bad, especially on epsilon 1, and it requires some fine tuning on this rescaling of the order, as you see, as some 5% to 10%, 5%. So, it, it, it is relevant to investigate the resonance's contribution to see if this picture can be improved or not. But this will need, of course, actual modeling, so let us fix the model. Let us choose the minimal composite Higgs model. So it is minimal in the sense that it provides you with uh, the three um, longitudinally polarized W and Z, the Higgs boson, and nothing else. 
So um, SO5 to SO4 provides us with four Goldstone bosons. So this is the composite sector. So how do we couple the elementary sector? We couple it in, the, in this way. So we take SU2L cross U1 to live inside the unbroken SO4. This, in general, this will break uh, the SO5 symmetry uh, and can, um, <coughs> can trigger uh, Higgs potential, who will, take, uh, who will trigger the electric symmetry breaking. So three out of these four Goldstone bosons will be eaten and one will remain and it will be the composite Higgs boson as a massive pseudo number Goldstone boson. So we have two breakings at uh, two scales. We can define the separation of scales. Resonances will appear with a mass which will be roughly the scale F um, times some strong coupling, and the decoupling effect of the whole composite sector will be achieved as F tends, goes to infinity with B fixed, and so for C tends to zero. So uh, if six tends to zero, basically we were left back with the standard model Higgs-Lagrangian with, with an elementary Higgs. So this model will be, will be built with the language of the CCWZ formalism, which is the natural formalism for spontaneous Hilberger effective theories, as it already uh, contains, the, it features the chiral expansion in a, in a very easy way. So without going too much in depth in the formalism, let me just say we have these two building blocks, which are two matrices. D is decomposed along the broken generator, so the SO5 or SO4 coset. E is decomposed along the unbroken generators. Their expression is this, so they contain an infinite sum uh, of terms with increasing number of fields. Pions are the, uh, gauge, uh, the um, Gosson bosons, the four Gosson bosons of SO5 to SO4, and these are just the WMB. This is a distinctive feature of the CCWZ formalism, so the transformation rule of D and E under some general SO5 transformation they are, we see that they transform with the local SO4 matrices. Um, they count as one derivative to the chiral expansion, and the Lagrangian will be built by combining D and E in all possible invariant forms. So at the lowest order in the derivative expansion, we can only form this operator, which contains the Gaussian boson kinetic term plus an infinite number of terms. So as I said, um, <coughs> At one loop, we can generate the uh, X potential. So I'm not going to say how this happens because uh, it's kind of complex. Let me just say you, we will need some sub-TV um, fermion resonances, some light fermion resonances. Let's just um, assume this happens. So how we can we take it into account? We can take it into account by introducing a web for one of the four pion fields. We can choose pi4 which will be basically, can be basically linked to the composite X boson field. So once I make this replacement, I can work out the Lagrangian, the CCWZ Lagrangian from the beginning. And if I do this, uh, I see that the two derivatives Lagrangian will contain the usual mass term for W and B. So by looking at this expression, we see that this quantity must be equal to V over F, and so this is, will be the square root of the separation of scales. Then, of course, we have uh, an infinite number of terms, uh, which, which will be interaction terms, uh, and it turns out that the rescaling of the Higgs couplings for this minimal model, A, is given by the square root of 1 minus Xi. Okay. Of course, then I can have more interaction with more number of derivatives if I want to add more and more operators. So let us uh, introduce uh, the resonances. Now, our assumption would be that there exists um, a heavy resonance, which is much lighter than the scale of the rest of the spectrum. Uh, so we are thinking in some sort of uh, decoupling limit for the rest of the spectrum. Uh, the resonance will interact with pions and, um, and gauge boson with some set of couplings that we can constrain with some uh, somewhat arbitrary criterion. We can choose, for example, this one. So. Uh, uh, at the scale of the cutoff, uh, the interaction strength of the resonance with other particles will be roughly at the same order of the, um, of the sigma model coupling at the, at the cutoff scale. It can be shown that with this assumption, the exchange of this resonance um, 
gives up, will give a partial UV completion of the pi pi scattering, so which is the longitudinal W scattering. So in the standard model, it is uh, fully unitarized by the exchange of elementary Higgs boson. In a composite Higgs theory, you expect this to be unitarized by exchanging a full tower of resonances, um, so a full tower of resonances. It can be shown that with this criterion, the exchange of the first resonance is already very important in giving uh, this uh, UV completion. So this, is, this can be called partial UV completion, which is PUVC. Okay, let us, in, let us introduce uh, an actual resonance. So uh, let us fix the resonance we want to consider. Let's consider a vector resonance living in a 3,1 plus a 1,3 of SU2 cross SU2, which is the unbroken SO4. So, we consider two triplets, one along SU2 left and one along SU2 right. Again, CCWZ formalism, so I have to introduce this field uh, in, uh, in a proper way, and uh, uh, the proper way is this one, so uh, same, uh, same behavior of local SO4 matrix uh, to implement a global SO5 matrix. And a minimal Lagrangian, so a kinetic term plus some mass terms will be this one, so this is just the ordinary non-abelian uh, SU2 uh, field strength, and this is the mass term, so. So pay attention. Ah, okay, no, you're right, sorry. <laughs> uh, okay, so uh, we see um, <laughs> from the structure of the formalism, once we have a mass, we will have also interactions, so rho times E and E times E. So, um, interaction will be basically described by this parameter. And if I impose PUVC on this set on interaction, you see that this A row must vary around something like order one. Okay. Now let me just introduce another operator which is very relevant for our purpose. That is this one. So this is the row field strength. This is just, it's another CCWZ structure which is basically addressing with pions of the um, of the, this is the field strength of the electroweak, uh, of, of the W fields, okay? So this is important for two reasons. One reason that it, con it contributes at three level to the S parameters, so to the high energy, to the heavy physics correction uh, to epsilon three, uh, and so it will be some sort of leading, uh, leading contribution. And then it is also important uh, because uh, as it describes uh, interaction between the composite and the elementary sector, because, I mean, if I, switch down, if I switch off the standard model fields, this is switched off, so this operator is switched off. So it, just, it is not something which is, um, which is a, um, which belongs to the full composite sector. So the PUVC uh, request cannot really be applied here. So I, I can only impose a, a somewhat a loser bound by the positivity of uh, the su 2 current spectral density, and so this is the bound I can, uh, I can impose, and I will see that this leaves some space uh, for, uh, for an important contribution. Okay, so let us make the full calculation, so let me show you some diagrams. This is epsilon 1, the composite x contribution to epsilon 1. This is the T hat parameter, so it's the, the um, heavy physics uh, correction to this one. Um, let me stress the fact that in, or, in this model, in order to generate some non-zero epsilon one, we have to, ins to use insertion of the hypercharge field because we need uh, some um, um, custodial symmetry breaking, and this is the, the only source of breaking in this model. This is instead this epsilon three. I, so I already show you these two diagrams. Um, this is a high energy contribution, uh, heavy physics contribution, and here we have a, a three level, uh, three level contribution, uh, which coming is coming both both from the raw mass term and from the operator alpha two I just showed you. So. Once we've done the full calculation, we can show some result. Uh, I'm showing you the results only for um, a single triplet, either left or right, the result is the same, just because the expressions are more compact and more manageable. And I'm showing you the delta epsilon, so uh, delta epsilon is just the shift from the standard model value, so delta epsilon one and delta epsilon three, this is the composite Higgs contribution. 
I already told you about these two divergent terms. These are some finite terms uh, which are rather involved and not worth showing. Um, these are the uh, heavy physics corrections. So this is the one loop T parameter. This is the tree level S. This is one loop S. You see the G, G prime squared uh, delta epsilon one for the insertion of the hypercharge. You see an overall uh, proportionality to Xi, which is V over F, with, which uh, is there due to the decoupling limit. So as I said, once you, once you send the Xi to zero, you have the standard model, so delta epsilon is equal to zero. Uh, what else? Uh, we have the uh, three level contribution to S, <coughs> which is made, uh, as, as I told you, by these two, these two contributions. So one may notice that this is negative and this is positive. This is positive, this is also positive, uh, even if there's a difference here, because we have to ask some, uh, b basically, the, as I said before, the positivity of the SU2 left current spectral density, or SU2 right, depending on if you introduce or left or right. But this is strictly negative, so uh, we are being somewhat lucky because uh, I told you the effect of these two guys is very bad, but these two are now pushing in the opposite direction, so there will be some hope for cancellations. So, um, we have five independent parameters, which are basically three energy scales, which are Xi, which is basically F, lambda, M rho, and two couplings, G rho and alpha 2. Let me trade G rho for A rho, which I recall the definition here. And now let's see some example of parameter space constraints. So. How the uh, unitarization of, uh, of WW scattering, uh, how, do, how do I see that in, in those formulae? What is the constraint there? You see what I mean or not? Uh, I mean, uh, here there is uh, no uh, relation with the unitarization of WW scattering as we are calculating uh, W self energies. No, but I know, but... Uh, yeah, but uh, okay, we, we, I think better discuss it, discuss it privately, yes. yes. Oh, okay, okay. So, um, let's start by setting alpha 2 equals 0, for example. Uh, so this leaves us with four parameters. I can fix the cutoff to the maximum value allowed by perturbativity. This is not really important as the cutoff dependence is loose, it's just log. Let's fix a row equal to 1 uh, and see, for example, what happens in the XEM row plane. And this is what happens. So the orange region is the one which passes the test. Uh, this is an unphysical region in which the row becomes uh, heavier than the cutoff. And for a row equals 1 also coincides with the region in which G rho is non-perturbative, so it's bigger than 4 pi. And this is somewhat an important indication because in this whole red region we have this, the fact that the one loop contribution to S becomes bigger than the true level one. So strictly speaking, you see that we are perturbative in all this region. As with, as with every perturbative calculation, um, uh, I mean, the more the theory becomes strongly coupled, the less you can trust it, of course. Uh, in this case, this dramatic thing happens uh, basically because there is a big number here, which is an accident, which is a 28. And so for G rho rather small, you, have, uh, you start to, to have this, this effect. By the way, this is just to signal the fact that the more you go up in this region, the less you can trust what happens here, of course. Now, for example, let's switch on alpha 2. Uh, alpha 2 can, uh, can cancel uh, the true level 1, so for example, enforcing a somewhat strong cancellation, this is what happens, so we gain some, some space here. So what to do next? One very important thing to do will be uh, adding fermion resonances, which is almost done. Fermion resonances are very important for uh, uh, some number of reasons, among which you, you, you need, as I said before, light fermions to generate the correct Higgs potentials, so uh, you need it basically lighter than uh, also because uh, 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 direct search is constraints, you need them to be lighter than vectors, so once you introduce vectors, you must also introduce fermions. Uh, they can give uh, a big uh, leading, uh, a big and positive contribution to T, so it can be important to, to, um, to study the interplay between vectors and fermions. Uh, 
and also about the interplays, when, once I add both, for example, I add a fermion and a five, I can add this operator, which is uh, interreading, I mean, you, add, you have it only if you have both. We contain some vertices we can enter in uh, lots of uh, effects, of, uh, for example, this parameter or the ZBB bar vertex. And of course, one uh, also very important thing to do will be to combine this full one loop uh, electroweak uh, in direct constraints with constraints for direct search, so aiming for some global uh, fit in some sense. Okay, I'm done. Do you have an estimate of the remaining theoretical uncertainty for real observables like the W boson mass? I mean, what you discussed were effectively gauge boson self energies. But if you really want to calculate an observable, more is needed. Do you have an estimate of the uh, theoretical uncertainty? I mean, uh, um Uncertainties on uh, theoretical uncertainties on standard model parameters is something which, uh, in my calculation, I mean, I'm just, uh, um, I am just uh, assuming that the W, the W mass is generated with, uh, with a value which is, uh, I, I mean, I, I do not have, uh, I do not. Uh, uh, have the W mass of every parameter, basically. Oh, he's asking about the precision of your prediction. If you were to assign an, a theoretical uncertainty on your epsilon parameters, say, as a first step, I mean, before you even go to pseudo observables. I didn't understand. We can take this offline. I mean, just the, th the precision of your prediction, your model dependent prediction, okay. has a certain precision, and the question is what is it? Well, basically, you also really, uh, I mean, if you build an effective theory, um, uh, if you build an effective theory from some strongly, strongly interacting sector, you are very more, uh, much more uh, influenced by some arbitrary assumptions that you make on the uh, effective field theory than in a summer model. Yeah. Is that, uh, I mean, the, the way to understand what it does is, is the following, that uh, uh, given uh, agreement with the mass of the W, mass of the Z, etc., uh, he pretends that, and, uh, that that is the most important effect. And as far as I understand, it's okay. All right. So let's thank Matteo again and uh, move on to the next talk.